Hey everybody, it's Tom and I'm coming to you today to talk about the many problems of mental causation, both in terms of that uh, actual phrase, but also it happens to be the title of this uh, lecture, which is nicely contained in this text, Philosophy of Mind, Classical and Contemporary Readings, and the lecture which I just sort of put up there uh, by Jaguan Kim. Uh, who has many fine books. Um, but this uh, essay that he has, or lecture, sort of nicely puts into relief uh, the issues around mental as opposed to, say, physical causation. By way of context, um, for instance, in our previous videos, uh, we noted uh, initially in connection with arguments or three of the principal arguments against the reducibility consciousness to barely material terms that a uh, broadly accepted or received view in the uh, philosophy of com mind community is that the relationship between the mental and the physical is one of supervenience. Supervenience being a particular sort of relationship where you have two sets of terms, facts, properties such that one set will supervene upon the other if such is the circumstance that any variation in the substrate upon which they are uh, varying, <coughs> upon which they are supervening uh, will track to a variation on the supervening class, right? Or to put it this way, a facts supervene on B facts, there will be no A difference without a B difference. Now, it's important to note that this is not a relationship of causality so much as it is a species of tight correlation. And even that is sort of a loose way of putting it, uh, but by way of giving us a sense colloquially of what's transpiring, I think it'll be adequate for the beginning of the discussion. Uh, the discussion then turning now to mental causation. And uh, historically, and this is an old problem, uh, but probably most famously arises in connection with Descartes, who uh, famously posited that the world is constituted by two different types of substances, mental substances, of thinking, thinking the mental world and physical or extended substances. And the uh, relationship between them was one of a kind of interactionism. And he was challenged by his contemporaries and historically has been looked at somewhat askance for uh, coming up short on being able to detail precisely how this interaction activity occurs or what have you right so that's you know the ancient context contemporarily the notion of mental substance has fallen uh, out of out of favor and the ascendant perspective at least within the analytic community um, the analytic philosophy of mind community is that and it's not universal but it's pretty broadly held that the the, the real substance which grounds the world is matter or the, the physical the physical stuff um, as it were right um, but now we come up against the problem that it seems to put it mildly highly counterintuitive to suggest that mental phenomena are totally bereft of causal influence on the physical world and actually, contrary-wise, there does seem to be something a bit weird even about suggesting that the physical world has a causal effect on the mental. Though um, that's not quite as bizarre as the, the, the former term where we simply cut out of uh, our consideration the idea that our psychic life, if you like, has no influence on what's happening to us or around us. Um, 
and <clears throat> you know if one really you know goes all the way with that what transpires is that the psychic or the mental dimension of our life is consigned to the status of being epiphenomenal is this sort of a froth which arises on the ocean of the material world as a kind of accident with uh, minimal if any relevance to what's actually happening in that aforementioned world um, and again there you that this this is this doesn't seem quite right which isn't strictly speaking to say that it's not right but one does seem to be working at odds with how life seems to be in saying something like um, your actual experience of pain, whether that be a merely quote-unquote physical pain, like, you know, you, you step on a tack, or an emotional pain, or a pleasure, or an emotional pleasure, that these experiences do not translate into um, an alteration in the line of, of history. <laughs> so um, the way that this problem is more formally uh, emergent or manifest, as Jai Guan Kim uh, uh, explains with uh, commendable lucidity, uh, well, there's really three different ways this comes up. One way, which arises in tandem with uh, an account offered by, let me check his name here quickly. Um, this is a, a cat by the name of Davidson. Um, shoot. And I don't have his... Hold on here. Get his, get his, first, get his first name here. Dag Nebit. It's not right in front of me. But anyway, the problem is it's called the problem of um, mental anomalism. Or mental anomalism. It's the thesis that uh, there are no regular, there's no law like regularity to mental events and phenomena. That they just sort of happen, and there might be some accidental order to them, but ultimately, uh, they themselves do not are not effectively subordinated to some kind of mental order or regime. That's not to say they're entirely inchoate. What's what what uh, what Davidson posits is that um, those regularities which we do encounter with respect to mental phenomena are simply um, sort of an after effect or a reflection, if I'm understanding it correctly, of physical regularities and physical laws. Uh, but this, well, attempting solution is one which doesn't seem to obey or respect the fact that mental and physical phenomena seem to be of two distinct Kinds at the end of the day, because of the ineluctable fact of experience of what it is to have a mental life, right? It's it's qualitatively distinctive from the notions that we apply to uh, inert, as it were, matter, just atoms in the void up and around and against each other. So there's a conflation of types which cannot just simply be stipulated. And so what Davidson does is he's actually putting things away which draws us back to the same uh, dichotomous tension that we found with Descartes. Another way that the issue of um, mental causation can be seen as uh, coming up is what's called the problem of sometimes the problem of uh, extrinsic mental properties. And uh, what, what do we mean by that? What we mean by that is presumably, certain presumably 
our, our mental states, such as belief, uh, cognition, memory, you know, they have something about them which is called intentionality. They have something, an aboutness to them. That's, intentionality here is being used in a technical sense, which differs significantly from the ordinary sense of uh, the word in common English usage. It just means when the state is intentional, that it um, has an object. So uh, you recall, you recall something. You feel, you feel something. And so on and so forth. Uh, and it seems that what it is that you are um, remembering or seeing or cognizing or feeling or what have you, what, what, what the content of that state is relevant to what happens in the wake of that state of apprehension. So, you know, um, whether you see a red light or a green light, presumably, will ramify <laughs> for whether you apply your foot to the uh, accelerator or the brake, uh, the gas pedal or the brake. The accelerator smithers, but um, under a merely physicalist account, it's difficult to uh, square the circle of the fact that they want to understand. The, the physical world is unfolding without reference to things like an internal um, intentional states of mind that are content. Or another way of putting it is that the content of the state is irrelevant to what actually uh, happens in the uh, external world. And uh, we can come back and I'm going to go at this issue uh, in greater detail in a subsequent um, video where we reference John Searle's arguments uh, or the Chinese room argument where this issue of syntax versus semantics comes up because that's what we're talking about is syntax versus semantics, right? Um, and it relates to, uh, as Jai Guang Kim notes here in his argu uh, arguments, uh, a computational theory of mind where uh, mental minds are seen mental minds, excuse me, where, you know, our mind is seen as operating just like a machine running operations, uh, sort of analogous to how uh, most computers run on a binary code. But notably, the machine is indifferent to whatever the content or the referent of the code is. The string of ones and zeros can refer to anything from traffic patterns to uh, medical records, to uh, the orbit of the planet Mars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the machine doesn't care. It doesn't care what it is that is being referenced by the code. It just runs the code. Um, it does not seem to coordinate with our experience as mental beings uh, that, uh, you know, that, we, that, 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 that the content of our mental state is indifferent what happens with that mental state. So um, we will return to that issue again in connection with the Chinese room argument in a subsequent video. The focus that uh, Jai Guang Kim directs us to uh, assume in his lecture is on a third way in which the problem of mental causation arises and he terms it the problem of causal exclusion and the problem of mental causal exclusion is made particularly acute when we situate ourselves within the framework of supervenience, to which we alluded at the outset. Now, if mental events supervene our physical events, that means that any mental event M instantiates occurs or happens when a certain set of physical circumstances unfold, instantiate, or happen. And uh, when a mental event M1 unfolds, then it unfolds in tandem with a set of physical circumstances P1, right? Now, 
from our vantage point, it would seem that well, we have mental state M. Say we um, smell something which reminds us of an experience we had in childhood, then all of a sudden we move to mental state 2, which is a reflection uh, upon that episode from our childhood. So we have a sensory encounter, an interpretation, that leads to a recollection. Right? So these are two distinct but correlated mental states where they are supervening upon, presumably, two different physical states. Our brain states are uh, variant. So the issue arises is that where is the, if, if there's something like causality occurring, and we're just going to assume for the moment in any event that causality is operative because some people might in fact challenge the category of causality itself as deserving of interrogation. But leaving that to the side, where is that causality occurring? Is it occurring because of the mental state? Oh, you know, I smell freshly cut grass. It reminds me of when I used to mow the lawn in high school. And then I remember in high school and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Is that occurring? Uh, well, well, what's causing that shift in mental state? What's causing that association? Is it mere physicality? Is um, the physical state of my brain, which is underlying or the substrate of that initial encounter or experience, then causing in turn a different physical state in my brain, which is then uh, producing this alternative reflection? Is this all just biochemical, bioelectrical? Right? If one is committed to the supervenient thesis, the weight of the relation uh, is more or less given to the substrate. So one is being compelled by that framework to assert that mental causation or the idea that this set of ideas causes that set of ideas is um, an illusion and that all the real groundwork is happening in a merely biochemical fashion. But this doesn't really seem to wash both in terms of how we actually encounter our life but also in terms of, uh, for instance, uh, the issues of externality that we just referenced a moment ago, right? Where the content of the mental state does seem germane to what's unfolding, but mere physical occurrences can only be invoked to explain things in a syntactical fashion, you know, a fashion which is uh, deaf. Uh, whatever the sound of the content is. Um, or, alternatively, we could be pushed even further away back to the issue of mental anomalism, where, you know, this correlation is just a stupendous accident, which is almost uh, reminiscent or redolent in some ways of uh, Leibniz and his monism. For those of you who, and the notion of a, a kind of pre-established harmony, for any of you who might be familiar with uh, Leibniz on that count. Um, but uh, as we noted the, at the outset, the problem with this, the problem with this assertion that mental causation um, is just an illusion and epiphenomenal is uh, precisely that it renders our life, our mental life, our internal world as being a mere accident, uh, which has definite repercussions. Um, for instance, uh, on the very, uh, on an ethical level, on, on a question of uh, human agency and freedom and our ability to uh, interact with the world. But also there's the problem, even if you don't want to get into the, the ethical uh, dimension of this controversy, which Jai Guam also points out, there's an epistemic problem. And that human knowledge itself 
seems to be predicated on some sort of mental causation or some sort of relationship between the mental and the physical, which is more than coincidental. Otherwise, it's difficult to uh, understand how we can acquire and uh, develop um, models and information about the world that inform, in turn, how we relate with the world and those relations create and elicit uh, more knowledge and more information, modifying our actions in other ways, right? That whole process is short-circuited. If, um, if, if a mental causation isn't real. But if mental causation is real, as by the way, I think that it is, then we encounter another problem. And this is what causes lots of people to hem and haw. And that is uh, what's called the uh, transgression <laughs> of uh, the thesis of um, physical closure, physical causal closure. In other words, the physical reality, physical world is causally closed. The only thing that can cause physical occurrences are other physical occurrences. But if we admit that the mental can have power over the physical, then we are opening up. <laughs> The physical world in a way which to some creates um, an ontological scandal and uh, oh where are we we are all the way back at Descartes and you know around and around the circle goes what's going on here well I have um, to indulge in some speculation here at the tail end of the video uh, a sense that the kind of antinomial quality of uh, this problematic points to a, 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 a defect in uh, the framing of the question itself. And uh, what do I mean by that? I mean by that that we have here a suggestion um, of a kind of distinction between the mental and the physical, which may in fact ultimately break down. Believe, I would suggest that in fact there is a more intimate relationship to those two facets or aspects of reality than is admissible within this sort of uh, dichotomous tact which is underlying the uh, a lot of the conversation and philosophy of mind, at least on the analytic side of the aisle. What do I mean by the analytic side of the aisle? To what I'm alluding there is that there's a kind of tension within academic philosophy between two broad camps, the analytic and the continental. Uh, and perhaps I'll do a video on the, the distinction between those two traditions. Uh, but they begin to diverge in the middle 19th century, middle to late 19th century, with the analytic tradition, which becomes dominant in the Anglo-American sphere, really focusing on um, issues of um, epistemology, logical refinement, and taking very seriously the uh, empiricism of people like David Hume. Um, what happens as a result of those emphases is, um, it is believed many questions, which are often thought of as uh, characteristically philosophical, are pushed into abeyance as uh, really beyond our ability to resolve without formally establishing certi certainty um, in respect to these logical and epistemological predicates. The continental tradition, uh, recognizing uh, while uh, that these are you know relevant claims, um, doesn't believe that we have the luxury of uh, residing forever in the uh, vestibule where we were resolving these logical and epistemological niceties. And um, under the continental umbrella, you're going to find people like the phenomenologists and the existentialists and, um, and then traditions of thought, which really sort of move beyond the merely philosophical into the literary, the artistic, etc. Etc. 
um, I don't want to draw too sharp of a line, uh, but it's in the, 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 the two camps are, are definitely uh, in tension with each other. Um, with the continental tradition, I would say uh, having in its uh, ranks people who are more inclined to uh, view the relationship between the mental and the physical as uh, perhaps more fluid or porous than um, people within the analytic tradition tend to see it. Well, so much, so much by way of my uh, sort of personal coda there. Anyway, this has been Tom talking about problems of mental causation as explicated by Jai Guan Kim in his article or lecture, uh, many Many problems of mental causation, which besides for being in this anthology, uh, was also in another MIT publication, which let me point that out to you here. Yes, uh, Mind in a Physical World. And I'll put the links below. Um, all right. So thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll be coming around here with more philosophy of mind stuff in the days ahead. All right. Have a lovely day. Ciao.